Um, so my name is Daniel Myers, and I've spent the past couple of years as a Leland Fellow working with the World, Home, the World Cocoa Foundation pardon, in, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire on a series of projects intended to bring together resources from cocoa and chocolate companies, international donors, and the Ivorian government to better secure land rights for both migrant farmers and indigenous landowners. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about why land rights are so important, but also so overlooked in efforts to fight deforestation and climate change, and why more broadly you should care about the land rights of the people involved in growing products like cocoa um, that function as tropical commodities. Next slide, please. So the first thing to know is that Cote d'Ivoire is the world's largest exporter of cocoa, which has brought with it considerable economic benefits for the country, um, but has also been the primary factor in driving us towards this map, which shows the extent of deforestation of primary forest cover in the country. Um, a simple version of this story is that cocoa grows very well on recently cleared forest land. Um, its yields then subsequently, oh, I think if we could go back, its yields then um, subsequently decline. Um, so it, it's kind of a vicious cycle that can continue um, towards the direction of deforestation. However, I show the slide because I think it's an incomplete story of the human and economic factors that led us to this map. Um, and primary among those factors, I will argue, is, uh, is land tenure and migration. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, the, the map on the previous slide would look somewhat familiar to, say, a, a farmer um, growing oil palm in Indonesia or, or um, soy or cattle in, in Brazil. Um, between 2001 and 2015 alone, the seven agricultural commodities shown on the left of this slide uh, contributed to the deforestation of an area the size of Germany. Obviously, that has devastating implications for efforts to halt deforestation and restore degraded land, which are a critical part of meeting the Paris Agreement goals by 2030. Um, accordingly, it could also exacerbate um, the expected wave of climate migration between now and the middle of the century, um, kind of furthering the, the cycle of environmental destruction and migration. Next slide, please. But concretely, how do land rights intersect with commodity-driven deforestation? Well, to use the example of Cote d'Ivoire, in the period after independence, the government encouraged migration to expand cocoa production in forested zones. And when migrants arrived in uh, traditionally indigenous areas, they often concluded verbal land use agreements with their indigenous hosts. The system worked while land was still relatively abundant, but as land has become more scarce, as remaining forest reserves have been depleted, and as the generations that concluded those verbal agreements have passed away, their children are left with increasingly uh, little certainty over who has what rights to the land on which they live. Um, one of the very many reasons that that is a considerable problem is that land tenure security is a precondition for restoring forested landscapes. However, in Cote d'Ivoire, only 2% of traditional land rights have been documented nationally, largely because of inflated administrative costs, but also because of community fears about the government's intentions in documenting the land in the first place. Um, one of the knock-on effects from that is that farmers typically have weak claims to the non-cocoa shade or fruit trees growing on their land, making them vulnerable to loggers. And that in turn makes the farmers themselves more reluctant to plant new trees that would be necessary for reforestation. That's of considerable concern to the Ivorian government and the cocoa industry, both of which have made major and public commitments to start to halt and reverse deforestation in their supply chains. Next slide, please. Um, luckily, over the course of my fellowship, I think um, I've been able to, to gradually learn what some of the solutions might be. Um, the first is there is a financial gap um, in farmers' ability, uh, ability to pay uh, for land documentation. That can be filled by industry donors and government stepping up and contributing um, to help meet the, the, the financial costs as land documentation is necessary in, a, in an environment where a market for land has developed, like in Cote d'Ivoire. However, documentation is in and of itself just a piece of paper if it's not accompanied by conflict resolution efforts um, or community dialogue around historical tensions around land, 
but also the community's fears in engaging with uh, land documentation projects run by the government in and of itself. Um, and lastly, I think we need more imagination in how land documentation projects are designed in recognizing that communities don't have monolithic needs with how they engage with the land. So to use a crude example, um, if two people are sharing an orange, you can cut that orange in half and give each side one, one half. Um, but it might be that one party is interested in the zest of the orange and the other is interested in the juice. Um, just so in, in parts of Cote d'Ivoire, indigenous landowners are more interested in receiving uh, financial support from their migrant tenants uh, for funeral services or school fees and a portion of the cocoa produce, whereas the migrant farmer might be more interested in just traditional um, full farming rights. So it just has to show that um, for external stakeholders, we need to be really careful about hitting uh, communities against each other in a zero sum game uh, for who has access and control of land, because those needs can be complementary at, at times. Next slide, please. But of course, everyone uh, throughout the process, all groups of actors can do more uh, to enhance land tenure security for both indigenous peoples and migrants. For agricultural companies, I would challenge them to move from just avoiding abuses on, uh, on land rights within their value chains to positively contributing to efforts to secure the land rights for the people living in the communities from which they're sourcing their products. And a huge factor in doing that is developing clear investment standards for land-related uh, land economic activities that affect smallholder, migrant, or indigenous land rights, and not just large-scale land acquisitions. Um, for governments, it's very important to document, to document existing land rights and access without picking sides socially or politically. And in order to do that, there has to be a real conversation about allowing semi-formal or communal land documentation, which more, might be more coach culturally appropriate in um, indigenous areas, for instance, than would be private land titles. For donors, there is a, a massive need to increase investment in land tenure as a mechanism to, to conserve and restore forests, um, as it's traditionally a neglected issue area in development, and also to focus on documenting indigenous people's rights um, while allowing room for migrants who obtained access rights through free prior and conformed and informed consent uh, to, to stay on the land where it's appropriate. For consumers, uh, there's obviously a big need to make more responsible purchases of the seven commodities I listed earlier in the presentation and their impacts on uh, land rights and deforestation, and to urge your elected representatives to direct more aid spending towards securing land rights in the effort to halt deforestation. Um, and with that, if anyone is really looking for extra credit, you can open your phone, um, pull out the camera app and go to the QR code in the top right of the, of the screen, um, which should take you to a blog post that I wrote discussing um, these issues in more detail because there is a lot of, of nuance with everything concerning land. So thank you. Thank you, Dan. And we have time for one quick question. As a consumer, what can I look for? What can I look for in my products to make sure that I am shopping responsibly? Yeah, it's, it's a big question, but I would say a couple of things. First, um, just assuring yourself that companies even have uh, sourcing policies around something like deforestation or land rights, which is more rare than commitments to um, reverse deforestation is, uh, is a big factor. Um, but also I think being conscious of some of the less immediately visible crops that we consume from tropical areas um, cocoa, I think, gets cocoa and coffee get a lot of scrutiny for, for good reason, but also because they're viewed as luxury products, where something like soy or rubber that we might use more commonly without being aware of it equally deserve scrutiny and are typically more opaque as industries. So I think um, just taking a more holistic view of all of the things we consume in modern life that come from these baseline commodities.